So again, thank you for joining our first detector workshop today. Um, it's really, really going to be a fun afternoon. We we have a the the group really has a fun uh, a fun bunch of presentations and breakout sessions planned. So uh, there's really going to be a, it's going to be a great afternoon. Um, so I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Shannon. Uh, who is the organizer of this event and put this all together for us. She reached out to me and was like, hey, want to do a first detector workshop? And I'm like, yes, I do. Thank you for contacting me. Um, neither of us considered that today is Good Friday. So, <laughs> but what a better way to, to spend the day talking about pests and pathogens and bugs. So um, go ahead, Shannon. I will ask that if you don't have any questions to go ahead and, and mute your microphone again. Uh, remember that sometimes we can get some of that feedback or if you get an incoming call, um, you know, that can be a little disruptive to everyone. So uh, this is going to be a very interactive afternoon. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or uh, speak freely if, if the presenter doesn't mind that. But for now, if you could mute your microphones, that would be fantastic. Shannon? Thank you, Michelle. Um, so I'm Shannon McAmis. I'm uh, the coordinator for the Florida First Detector program. Uh, and I'm super excited to be putting on this workshop. I didn't know it was Good Friday, but I hope I'm very happy that if you had today off that you're joining us on your long weekend. Um, and so just I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, I will be talking about I'll have the first talk about um, pests and pathways. And then Michelle is going to be talking about um, some different tips for taking good photographs of different specimens. And then we also have Brad Danner, who is the state coordinator for the CAPS program. That's um, the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey. Um, and he'll be talking about the surveying efforts going on in South Florida and in, in, in Monroe, Monroe County. <laughs> We also um, will hear from Dr. Amanda Hodges about palm weevils. She's the director of the Florida First Detector Program and is also um, director of the Doctor of Plant Medicine Program and the Biosecurity Research and Education Lab. Dr. Hodges, was there anything you wanted to add? We're just so happy to be here with you today. We're excited uh, to have this opportunity to join you on a Good Friday with Michelle as we talk about bugs and invasive species and how we can learn more and look for some of these uh, invasives that we don't have in Florida. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, and last um, but not least, I'll also introduce our group leaders throughout the program today. We'll have a couple of small breakout groups and um, that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for Dr. Gideon Alaki, who um, is a postdoctoral um, in the entomology department at UF and also Trevor Forsberg, who just recently graduated from the University of Florida with his undergrad. Um, and so speaking of breakout groups, uh, we're going to go ahead and put everybody into small breakout groups. And from here, we're just going to do a little icebreaker for our first activity. We're just going to um, unmute, get used to talking. We only have five minutes, so um, keep that in mind when um, we get there. Uh, but just introduce yourself and get the technical issues out of the way. Um, and just like Michelle said, try to stay muted during the um, presentations, but in the breakout groups, um, feel free to unmute. And then um, if you do have questions for the speakers, you can go ahead and put that in the chat and we'll either get to that in the um, question and answer session or we'll answer it directly in the chat. The rooms are open, so you should see your invitation. Shannon, you're in room five, but okay. the first you don't have an invitation. Thank you. All right, um, if everybody's back, I did want to say that we will be recording um, this uh, every the, the speakers, so um, just keep that in mind. Um, and let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so to start off the workshop today, we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly makes a species invasive and how they even end up here in Florida in the first place. There we go. 
Um, so native, introduced, invasive, non-native, exotic, um, there's a bunch of different words. And having all these different words, I'm sure it helps keep dictionaries in business, but for everyone else, it can get pretty confusing pretty quickly. And a lot of times these words get used interchangeably, but might actually mean a couple of different distinct things. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is review some of the vocabulary that scientists and decision makers use when discussing plant pests. This slide contains pictures of each one, a native, an introduced, and an invasive species. Do you know which one is which? Um, so you can go ahead and if you want, type in the chat. Uh, which one you think is the native, which one you think is introduced and invasive. And I'll be showing these pictures again on the correct slides of which one is which. So native species are organisms, which means any plant, animal, or even fungi and bacteria whose presence in an ecosystem is the result of only natural processes. And it's not the result of human intervention. So um, if anybody was able to guess blueberries uh, for the native species, good job. They're native to the continental US along with wild turkeys and of course, uh, Florida's favorite alligators. Um, introduce, so as the word suggests, introduced species are organisms that originate in one region but are introduced to another region where they become acclimated and established in that new area. Establishment means that the organism can survive and reproduce on its own, allowing it to maintain a stable population in that new area. Humans are, um, are also the source of introduction, which is, um, can be either accidental or it can be intentional too. And another uh, important point for introduced species is that they can have either beneficial or detrimental effects on the environment. Um, so peaches and honeybees are both examples of introduced species that are considered to be beneficial. Honeybees were introduced from Europe, but their pollination has beneficial effects on the environment, especially for humans. And a, a lot of crops, including the blueberries from the last slide, rely on the pollination services from those managed honeybee colonies. So now for invasive. Um, the National Invasive Species Council defines invasive species as being not native to the ecosystem and whose introduction will likely cause harm. That harm could cause negative impacts on the environment or economic loss, and sometimes it even poses a risk for human health. So introduced species don't always cause harm, but if it does, then it is an invasive species. Um, this means introduced species are not always invasive, but invasive species are always introduced. And just like introduced species, invasive species are usually introduced by people, although usually it's accidental through shipping of goods or movement of people from country to country, but sometimes they are intentionally introduced. Um, and a lot of times it's the release is, if the release is intentional, it's because the person doesn't realize that that um, organism could have a negative impact on the, the environment. And one example of this type of introduction is the giant African land snail. In 1966, a boy smuggled three snails back from Hawaii to Miami, and then he released it, them in his grandmother's garden once he got back to Miami. And just those couple of snails um, that were introduced and released caused a huge ordeal, which um, they had to have a eradication effort um, from by FDAX, and that took over 10 years and cost over a million dollars. Um, and so it's, I'm sure the boy did not realize that when he introduced them to his um, uh, grandmother's garden, but there are negative impacts to invasive species. And one last definition, um, and it makes sense with the title of this talk being Pests and Pathways. Um, I want to go over exactly what I mean by pest. A pest is a species um, of organism that compete with humans for resources we value. For example, pests may consume or damage food, fiber, or other materials intended for human consumptions. Um, those giant African land snails eat a tremendous number of different plants and sometimes they even eat the stucco and plaster off of buildings. 
Um, and so pests can be native to an area or they can be invasive or introduced. Um, for example, this slide shows two different forestry pests. On the left is the southern pine beetle, which is a native species that attacks pine trees. And then on the right, we have the emerald ash borer, which is an introduced or invasive species that attacks ash trees. So they're both considered pests, even though one's native and one is invasive. Uh, Shannon, sorry to interrupt you, but Rosie indicated that she's having a little trouble hearing you. So maybe you could try to up your volume a bit. Thank you. Okay, is this a little bit better? That's much better, I think. Yeah, much. Um, all right, so um, now that we are on the same page for what native, introduced, and invasive and pests mean, um, now we can get to the fun part, which is um, we got a couple questions and go ahead, feel free to put these into the chat. Um, so the first one is how are new species introduced and um, why does Florida seem to get so many? Um, so first, let's talk about actually how new species get to Florida. And we said that most of the time new species are hitching a ride along with people. So how do people get to Florida? Um, well, one, of, one way is through air travel and Florida has a lot of airports, 12 international ones, and that doesn't even include the smaller um, airports. And these air, uh, airports are gonna bring in people, but they're also gonna bring in goods and then sometimes also pests. And an example of the goods that come into these international airports um, are cut flowers. So here we have a graph showing um, where flower imports arrive into the US and the overwhelming majority, 88% of the entire country's flower imports enter through Miami International Airport. And these flower imports are um, live plant material, which uh, could house an um, plant pest and where it's a good um, opportune time for them to hitchhike on that live plant material. Another very important commodity to arrive by plane are fruits and vegetables. And similar to flower imports, a majority, 55% of imports arrive through Miami. And this means even more plant material for pests to hide out and enter Florida. In addition to the 12 airports, Florida also has 14 deep water ports that play an, an important role in international trade. And each one of these is a potential pathway for new and invasive species to arrive in Florida. And then um, living in Monroe, you have the port of Key West and also the port of Miami, um, very close, close by. And one example of how these pests can be stowaways on these imports is the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, which is thought to be introduced to the US through infested wood packing and shipping material itself, and not actually the commodity that was being shipped inside the material. Um, so the photo in the middle shows these pallets being inspected. And on the right, you can see an example of damage to a wood pallet from the Asian longhorn beetle. Lastly, invasive pests um, can come into Florida through commercial shipments of agricultural, ornamental, or forestry products that originated in a different part of the United States and are brought to the Florida on trucks. Um, the brown marmorated stink bug and the bugatta bug are two pests of concern which have arrived in this fashion. Part of the mission of uh, Florida's Cooperative Agricultural Pest Surveys is to inspect agricultural shipments arriving into Florida from other states. And although less than 5% of these agricultural shipments can be thoroughly inspected, in 2012, um, CAPS actually detected brown marmorated stink bugs in, in Bogota Brug um, three times at each different interdiction states um, or stations, which is where they uh, inspect the com commodities coming in on um, in, through the trucks. And the brown marmorated stink bug is also known to sometimes hitch rides in people's cars that are traveling into the state from somewhere um, from out of state. So now we know how new species arrive and we can get back to why there seems to be so many in Florida. 
And one of a huge contributing factor is just the sheer amount of plant material that passes through the state, either through the airports, the seaports, or interstate travel. And then another contributing factor is tourism. A lot of people want to come visit Florida's beaches, especially the Keys. And with people coming from all over the world to visit, it also just increases the chance that one of them might accidentally pack a pest in their luggage and it's able to arrive in Florida through their luggage. And then just like people, um, when a pest does arrive here, they may kind of like it and want to stick around. And so the climate here is suitable for many different types of organisms, especially invasive ones. Um, so our climate allows for an extended growing season. And that means there's a continuous food source for agricultural and horticultural pests. And in addition, um, to that, the southern part of Florida, there is no hard freeze. So that means that the organisms that would normally um, die off during a hard freeze don't, don't die and are able to live through the winter and then come back again in the spring. And with that, uh, thank you all for joining me. And let me know if you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Just one quick comment, and that is there are those of us who move down here and say, oh, all the house plants I had in New Jersey can live outside now. Not a good idea since half of them are invasive. <laughs> yes, and um, the presentation I was mainly focusing on pests um, like or uh, pathogens, but you're totally right with plant material being brought in. And a lot of people are, it's kind of the cool thing, like, oh, I got this neat plant and neat now, but it might not be now be so neat a couple years from now when it's all over the place. <laughs> uh, uh, the other thing that um, folks moving down here from other states don't know, because I'm guilty of this myself when I first moved to Florida, um, is that if you are carrying house plants from up north, you're technically supposed to stop at those interdiction stations that Shannon mentioned and have them inspected for pests before you come in. Um, but a lot of people don't know that. Um, Cause that's, you know, we think more about just commercial shipments and things like that coming through those inspection stations, but they, they do want to look at anything that is agricultural, horticulture, or aquaculture coming through those, those road guard stations. And do they have those stations on I-95? Because I can remember the stations and stopping when we were kids coming down on vacation from New Jersey, but I don't remember seeing any signs or any place to stop when we moved down here on, on, on the interstate. So um, the, the, you know, they have the regular way stations that are operated by the, um, you know, the, the state, um, you know, the state of Florida police department, but then there's also the agricultural interdiction stations, which are probably relatively newer than those stations and may not have, uh, may not have been in existence when you were a kid. Um, but they, they are, they're, they're clearly marked now. And there is one on I-95 in Yuli, just as you come in um, to Florida from Georgia. Ah, huh, okay. I'll look for it next time. <laughs> <laughs> and there is an ingoing and an outgoing station. They do inspect outgoing um, produce as well. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, Michelle is going to head in. If you want to share your screen, we can, um, she's going to talk about some different tips to taking good photos that since uh, everything's virtual, um, photos are just always come in handy and um, how you can take some nice, good, clear photos. Okay, so tips for taking photos. So why do we really need photos? Uh, well, obviously more information is better. Uh, including photos with your submission, even to those that uh, if you do that through the distant, distance diagnostic lab, or even if you're just including photos for us, it really can provide diagnostic clues. And especially if, if we're sending something to the lab um, that's traveling through the mail uh, and it's taking a few days to get there, it, it likely didn't get there through any ideal conditions. So the symptoms that we might be observing here versus what they may be able to see in the lab might be a little different. So photos can really help provide context to the plant problem 
and the growing conditions, especially if those photos include, you know, some of the surrounding environment as well. And this can help rule out any abiotic factors um, that can help shed light on the pest problems that maybe that we didn't necessarily originally consider. And so this, again, you know, the more photos that we take, the better we can get at this skill of, of becoming, um, uh, following best practices for our, our diagnostic features. And then of course, another uh, benefit is then we have those for our own records, right? Especially if it's taken from a community garden or from our own landscapes, this can help us catalog any pest issues that we encounter from year to year and help like with what we're doing with our backyard observations here locally. So as you can see here we have on the slide, it's a photo of a diapreppery's root weevil uh, from a blueberry farm. And this really helps because um, they've included their hand holding the blueberry for scale. And then you can see on the right, there's a healthy blueberry plant in the same field. So that actually does provide clues because it lets the, the expert or the person that is um, working with the sample know that, okay, there's some healthy blueberry plants in this field and not all the uh, plants are affected by whatever is, is going on. So what equipment do, do we use? Well, all of us now have really great smartphones that keep us preoccupied with millions of other things <laughs> than what we should actually be doing, but they also do have useful uh, cameras attached to them and, and some are, are pretty powerful cameras. Um, and for those specimens where we might need a little bit more detail or um, take photographs of scale or mealybugs or smaller insects, you can even purchase um, macro lenses or magnifying lenses to attach right to your, to your smartphone. And that really, really comes in handy. I know a lot of you are, are using that type of setup already. And they have them from, with a range of, of prices from five to $50, but um, pretty much they all work really well. You just wanna make sure that they are compatible with your individual phone. And so I know a lot of us have cases on our smartphones. Um, and so that may uh, you know, work against the whatever microphone or magnifying lens that you purchase. So you may need to take off your cases and those are some other things to consider. Also um, dissecting microscopes. We have a dissecting microscope in our lab in Key Largo and in Key West. And so if you're actually you know, doing a, a plant clinic per se at our, um, in our office, uh, you can even hold your phone over the, um, you can hold your phone over uh, the, the eyepiece. And this is what, you know, this is how this mealybug photo was taken and get a pretty good photo to send to, uh, off to the experts if it's something that we're not able to identify. So uh, some specific things to insects. Um, the more, the better, right? The more uh, pictures you can submit and tell the story obviously is, is going to um, help the person that is trying to decipher what is in these photos. And so with DDIS, you can include up to seven pictures. So you would want to include photos of the host and the damage, and if possible, multiple life stages. Oh, one second really important to also take, uh, again, like we said, take multiple photos of the insect from um, different angles, from the top, from the side. Clear images um, are, go are going to be the most helpful of the head, thorax, abdomen, even the antennae and the wings can be really diagnostic in helping uh, determine what, what species this is. So if you see, look at these um, two pictures over here on the right, it, they look pretty similar, right? Um, but the more photos that we look at uh, of different angles, we can see actually they are a little bit different. So on the left here, this is actually a beetle. It's a net winged beetle. And then on the right here, you have a type of one of the species of Decladia moths. So even though they may look similar, they're actually um, very different. So the, the more photos and the, the more clear photos that you can include are always going to be uh, helpful to the person that's trying to um, decipher what, you know, what they're looking at or what species that is. And color can really aid in identification in many cases. So it's best often to use either a live specimen or something that has um, recently been killed because, because color can change on many different species. So um, that 
is also very important. And you do wanna consider the background. So oftentimes if you're working with a, a dark insect, actually the, a dark background helps really with, with uh, some black insects that you may be working with. It's always helpful to use some type of object for scale. So um, like that was in the other picture, your hand, a coin, a ruler, a pencil, um, those are often uh, different things that can be used for, um, you know, just showing what the, the scale of the specimen. It also helps if you keep the, the insect or specimen for future um, information. So if you've sent these pictures off, maybe they weren't um, clear enough. Maybe the, the expert needs a little bit or specialist needs a little bit more information. And so that, that really helps if you still have that insect uh, available. And of course, we do want to review the pictures while we're taking them. So if something didn't come out a little bit clear, maybe it's a little bit blurry, you can retake those photos and it becomes really easy at that point. And then also um, send the original image, not a resized one, because what they're going to do, what the specialists, once they receive these images, they're going to be blowing these up to look at those finer, smaller diagnostic features. And if you've resized your image or you manipulated it in any way, it can make it a little difficult for that once they blow those images up, it becomes uh, harder to see those diagnostic features. What are some things to consider for plants? So I know we've, we've talked about this at, at nauseum, right? Especially over the last year that we've pretty much everything has been virtual. So um, again, the more photos, the better showing different characteristics. Uh, you do want an overall photo of, of the whole specimen. So you can see a branching pattern, uh, and things like that. But a lot of, of what you need, especially for plants, is going to be close-ups of the leaves. The top and the underside can really be useful in helping to aid in identification. What is the leaf arrangement? Do we have a compound or a simple leaf? Um, you all know that we get so many <laughs> samples or photos sent to us of an individual leaf. Well, that really doesn't do much to help us with, with um, determining what plant this is, right? And also bark can be very um, helpful in, in identification and, and especially the reproductive parts, right? The flowers and the fruit. So if, if, if the flowers and fruit are present, that is really something that's very important to include in those photos. Also something to consider that, that we might not think about is you really wanna try avoiding taking pictures during the midday because uh, photos in full sun can really bleach out some of those finer details that, that you need when you blow up those photos. So it, it really does help if it's maybe a little cloudy outside or taking your photos um, in the beginning part of the day or later in the afternoon. Just avoid the, that time of day when it's, it's, that sun is really intense. What also helps, um, if you have trees that are um, located close together, um, you know, it's in a hammock or something, and so it can be really hard for your camera or phone to uh, really um, zoom in or, or get a clear photo of, of the leaves that, that you really need. And so you can really kind of help uh, have a clear uh, piece of paper and put that behind it, and that, that really does help um, with that. Plant pathogens. What are some things to think about with plant pathogens? So are we gonna be able to really determine anything from a dead plant, <laughs> which we get so often? My plant is dead, can you tell me why it's dead? That's really not gonna do anything for us, right? I, I think we've all, we've all learned that at this point. So really um, what you really wanna try and do is have um, that transition zone, especially from healthy tissue to, to to disease tissue or dead tissue really can help um, the, the specialist in, in trying to figure out what the problem was here. Um, are there any signs of the pathogen? Is there any um, oozing or any type of special growth that you're starting to see? Again, that can be very useful um, to those that are trying to determine what is going on. But uh, if we're talking about, you know, if you're seeing that material on the dead part of the plant, that could actually be secondary. So again, that would be information you would want to include on your sample submission form. And then of course, 
Um, what are some of the uh, plant care maintenance that has been done? What is the watering schedule and fertilization? Has there been any um, pesticides or herbicides or anything applied to the plant? All of that is going to be really useful information because oftentimes, uh, again, you all are, are very familiar that it's not often just one thing that's occurring. So it's often there's there's a multiple things that are going on. And so the more information you can provide is going to be the better. It's It really is a lot like becoming a detective, trying to get the clues to try and solve a puzzle. So again, um, we wanna include photos of the entire uh, plant. You really um, you wanna give uh, some kind of context to where is this plant growing? Is this in your yard? Is this a cultivated plant? Is this uh, in a natural area? Um, or is are these plants growing in a container? Um, what is the situation going on? Because that can also determine the what they do in the lab to try and decipher what's going on as well. So if these plants are in a community garden, it would be really uh, worthwhile to know, okay, how many plants are affected? Uh, is it just this one individual plant or there other, or is it starting to spread out from this one individual plant or is, is everything else healthy um, in, in this area? The um, photo here is of olive trees growing in a well-drained sunny field with mature trees bordering one another. So a sample submitted from one of these trees is gonna be analyzed a little differently from ones that are just of a single ornamental olive tree from a home landscape. So all of that information becomes very useful. For instance, um, just like this picture. So here we have uh, an, an amaryllis uh, growing in a container and we've got healthy tissue and we've got obviously some diseased tissue here. Um, and, but if this would be a good situation to have uh, uh, some type of hand lens or magnifying lens attached to your phone where you could get really get a better picture of close up of, of what's going on. So these are these spores and that becomes really useful to aid in identification. Oh, sorry. Talk a little bit about mushrooms. Again, what uh, is going to be useful for the specialist in determining um, what species of fungi that they're looking at. So again, taking pictures of the entire fungus uh, and also the place where it was grown or where you found it is really gonna give context to the situation. Mushrooms can have really a bunch of different sides. So you wanna include multiple pictures of the different angles and really give um, the expert a better idea of what the situation is for identification. So showing pictures of uh, the top of the cap the sides of the cap and, and definitely the bottom underside. If it has a stem or a stipe, that also is going to be very useful. And it really helps if you can get all of, of those elements together in, in a photo like you see here. The scale, the knife is in there for scale and we have all these different parts that really are going to help the specialist with identification. Are there any um, obvious spore deposits? That's going to be very useful as well. And you're gonna to wanna to note what is the color of those spores? Um, mushrooms vary widely in size. And so again, having some type of item in there for scale is gonna be really useful. What substrate did you find it in? Um, in the woods, uh, a bunch of mulch or leaves? What, what is the surrounding area? <clears throat> again, that's gonna be very useful for the specialist. One thing to consider for, for, or a few things to consider for all of all of the uh, photos that you take is you wanna make sure your photos are in focus. Um, we get so many photos that, you know, when you open them up to any size that would be useful for identifying, and, and then they become very blurry and that really makes identification um, hard. And now you're, you're spinning your wheels, you're, you're um, spending, you know, time just trying to get to a, you know, a reliable photo to try and help. Um, so the, the better images that you provide initially are really going to help speed the process along. Again, uh, same, same sort of uh, thing, make sure that the resolution is high enough so people, the, the specialists can zoom into those diagnostic features. I think that's it for this presentation. So, um, 
this uh, presentation is part of the first Florida First Detector program. And so um, a lot of information was gleaned from other sources, um, Dr. Buss, uh, Mark Frank, which, which you all know in, in different areas. And then of course, our fir Florida First Detector team for um, putting this presentation together. Thank you so much. I know you all are familiar with the DDIS system. And so that can really help, um, you know, it's a one-stop shop of kind of um, submitting these photos to and them getting to the people that can help answer these questions. And so first, of course, uh, you know, we try to solve the, the, the problem locally, you know, and if you uh, contact me and, and then I don't know the answer and then we can go to the various experts and DDIS is just a nice um, platform or software that allows us to do that in all in one location. Okay, I think that's it. Did anyone have any questions? Michelle? Oh, goodness, there's a lot of things here. Yes, yes. Um, Shannon, did you have something you wanna say? Oh, no, I was just gonna uh, ask if there's questions for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dead plants tell no tales. <laughs> and there is, there is a question. Um, I think Susie was gonna ask it, and maybe again. So you don't want us to edit the photographs at all, not even the, the quick fix thing. You want Honest, to it, it, when, when the photos are manipulated, sometimes when they, we get them on our end, it, it can be a little challenging. If you're doing a little bit of cropping, that's one thing. Um, but if you're you know trying to go in and add other features, oh. sometimes it, it may look um, clear and um, vibrant on your end, but then, you know, um, when it gets to, to my yeah. screen or somebody else's screen, it can be very different. Um, so cropping something, you know, that's not really what we're talking about. It's, it's just trying to do some of those touch up features, maybe that um, when we try and blow those, those images up, make it a little challenging. I just needed clarification on that. Thank you. Michelle, what does DDIS stand for? Oh, goodness. Distance diagnostic inventory system, I think. Okay. Thanks for the quiz, Lori. <laughs> so, so, so the I is identification. Ah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, well, um, if there's not any other questions, we'll go ahead and move into our uh, first activity. So we'll be going back into those breakout groups. Um, and then we'll have 30 minutes there. And once we um, break from those groups, we're going to take a little bit of a break. So if you want to break directly from the breakout group, that's totally fine. Um, but we will be back at 325 uh, to start um, the next presentation. But right now we're all going into groups. Okay, it's uh, 325. Um, we can go ahead and get started again. Um, and we have Mr. Brad Danner, who's going to be talking about CAP surveying. Okay, so um, just give you a quick little um, overview of what the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey is. Um, it is a um, cooperative agreement between the uh, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, it is a, a nationwide program and each state has its own um, version of the CAPS program. Um, but here in Florida, we are uh, fortunate to have one of the most robust um, teams um, in the country. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, just Florida and its unique um, climate and various other attributes that put us at very high risk of pest introduction. Um, our primary goal is to detect um, plant pests and diseases of regulatory concern. And um, I told this to uh, my folks in my breakout session, but I will um, let the entire group know. Um, most of what we're concerned with are things that are not known to occur um, within the United States, um, let alone Florida. There are a few exceptions to that, but a lot of what we're looking for are considered offshore risks. Um, I am the state survey coordinator of the program, and I work very closely with the state plant health director's office over at the USDA here in Gainesville. 
Um, I have a lot to cover today, um, so I'm going to probably go through this quickly, um, but it's my understanding that there was some interest in what my program is doing in your part of Florida. So um, this is an overall map of how CAPS breaks down the region or the state into regions. And then um, the list of all of the positions that are associated through the state and through the uh, federal government with our program here in Florida. Um, but for the purposes of today, I'm going to be focusing on what is listed here is CAPS Area C, which includes Monroe County into the, you know, into the Keys. <clears throat> this is a list of our current um, surveys. Um, you will be hearing a little bit about our EWBB, our Exotic Woodboring Beetle Program. Um, our corn commodity and nursery surveys. I'm going to briefly touch on our small grain survey, but that is something we just started this year, so I don't have a lot of data to share on it yet. Um, and then I'll also be showing you some of our tomato commodity pests, which are part of a PPA, which is the Plant Protection Act, which is formerly known as the Farm Bill Program through the USDA. And then some of the other programs that we're associated with here, the high risk and the interdiction stations that Shannon told you about earlier. Um, outreach and training. Um, CAPS has been partnered with the University of Florida to conduct these first detector workshops for quite some time. And then of course, a forestry program, um, which is called early detection rapid response, but I'm not gonna go into that one today. Um, so just a little bit about our EWBB survey and how we target. Um, we survey and monitor high risk areas that pose the greatest risk of introduction and establishment of exotic wood boring insects. And a lot of this has to do with wood packing materials. Um, big dunnage pile that you see in the bottom picture here on a port of entry. So one of those ports that Shannon mentioned earlier, seaports or airports, sometimes they pile up wood debris after they've you know, opened the containers and things like that will place traps, as you see in the two other pictures, those are called Lingren funnel traps, with a lure attractant that will attract certain exotic beetles of interest. Um, we focus this survey around campgrounds, natural areas, green areas around ports, and disturbed areas such as hurricane damage. This is a list of the um, some of the current targets on our um, EWBB survey, and these are specifically um, targets that use a trap and lure combination. Um, we have the large pine weevil, um, black fur uh, sawyer beetle, Mediterranean pine shoot beetle, and the um, Japanese pine sawyer beetle are all pests of um, pine and other evergreen um, species. Then we also have the oak ambrosia beetle, which um, is a pest of oaks and, and other hardwoods. Um, the majority of the beetles that we look for in this program are bark and ambrosia beetles in the, um, you know, platypodine or scolotine groups. Um, but we also do some visual surveys for um, longhorn beetles, which are in the cerambicid family. And then we also trap for um, some jewel beetles. The most uh, familiar one to you guys is probably the emerald ash borer. However, um, we don't have any ongoing emerald ash borer surveys in, in your part of Florida because ash is not real, uh, real common down there, at least to our knowledge. Um, but for South Florida, this is where our lingering funnel traps are staged. So you can see, um, at least for Monroe County, and Monroe County is kind of a challenge for us because of the um, Everglade National Park. Um, it becomes difficult for us to trap in that park. And so a lot of times we do our best to trap around the park. Um, but you'll see um, we have um, some traps in the upper keys and then of course all the way down in Key West. That's gonna be um, down there near the Fort Zachary Taylor State Park. Um, we've actually done a lot of work down in that park over the years and I'll, I'll explain some of that later. Um, but this is the distribution of our beetle traps associated with those beetles I showed you on the previous slide. Um, this is where we're trapping for them. Um, there is a visual component to the survey and there are two longhorn beetles. Um, and actually this first detector program um, has done a nice job of presenting specifically on um, the Asian longhorn beetle in the past. Um, so if you ever are all interested in another workshop with them, um, they could probably include that at some point. 
Um, but the Asian longhorn beetle and the citrus longhorn beetle, um, they look very similar. There's actually some very minute differences between the two. Um, but our program looks for both of those. Um, these are going to be pests of uh, hardwoods, mostly maples and elms and um, sycamores, um, some other hardwoods. But then in addition to those pet, um, hosts, the citrus longhorn beetle also obviously goes after citrus trees. Um, this is our distribution of surveillance for those. And you can see once again, um, we have Key West area um, for citrus longhorn beetle and Asian longhorn beetle survey. Um, spotted lanternfly, um, that is included in our EWBB survey as a visual. Um, we're just really following a pathway there. They're not wood borers, they're actually um, true bugs. Um, but I'm gonna get into spotted lanternfly later in the presentation. Moving to our corn commodity survey, this one's gonna focus mostly on lepidopteran pests. Um, and then we have some diseases as well. Um, and a couple of these you'll see uh, recurring in many of our surveys. The old world bollworm is one of them. That's probably one of the most important pests we look for in Florida. Um, it is a noctuid moth. Um, and the larval stage is the most damaging stage. Um, and this particular pest can feed on excess of 200 um, agricultural and cultivated crops. So um, we have it in our corn commodity survey, tomato commodity, and our nursery survey, and our small grain survey, actually. So this pest pops up a lot. Um, and then the false codling moth in, shows up in multiple surveys, too. Um, this is going to be a tortricid moth. Um, it's going to be quite a bit smaller. Um, than the old world bollworm. Um, the, the biggest issue with these is it's uh, a, a naked eye identification is, is almost impossible, especially with old world bollworm. You actually have to dissect um, the male genitalia to distinguish old world bollworm from a um, naturalized or native species, Helicoverpa zea, which is the corn earworm. Um, this is our distribution of corn commodity. As you can see, we really are not in Mon Monroe County for this one at all. Um, merely due to the fact that I don't think there's a lot of corn grown in the Keys. However, if any of you know of any, um, uh, what my actually my South Florida Pest Survey Specialist is, is on this meeting today. Her name is Dr. Lillian Motero uh, Pujol, and she's my South Florida Pest Survey Specialist. And, um, if anyone is interested in working with CAPS to set up traps for any of the pests that you see in my presentation today, I can put you in touch with her and she would be interested in working with you. <clears throat> um, here's another visual target for corn commodity survey. This is the cucurbit beetle. Um, it's going to feed on corn and other cucurbits. Um, this is strictly a visual. We don't have a trap and lure for this one. Um, but we look for it at all of our corn commodity sites. Um, another visual target, this one is not of um, national concern, this one is of state concern, um, and it is moving closer to Florida. I think it might be in Georgia, actually. Um, but this is the hedgehog grain aphid, and it's, um, according to our identifier at DPI, Dr. Susan Halber, it's a pretty easy one. It's dark black with um, with spiky hairs, and where it gets its name hedgehog grain aphid from. Um, but this one is in our corn commodity and small grain surveys. So this is a this is kind of a, a grass pest, so to speak, or a cereal crop and, and corn pest. We also do some diseases in corn commodity. Um, these ones are going to be you know kind of difficult for people to to deal with. You really need a pathologist to help you out with this. Um, but late wilt of corn. Um, it's known distribution around the world is in Egypt, India, Hungary, uh, Portugal, and possibly uh, Kenya and Romania. Um, it is um, a, a pest of corn and cotton, specifically here for Florida. Um, we haven't found it, but those are the, the crops that we're looking for um, this particular disease in. It is a soil-borne fungus um, and initially starts on the roots and then becomes a vascular wilt disease. Uh, meaning it kind of attacks the plant from the inside and causes it to wilt. Um, it mostly affects seedlings, um, but severe infections can reach the fruiting bodies of the corn and affect the kernel production. Um, and it can remain viable in the soil for, for many, many years. 
Philippine downy mildew. Um, this one is particularly interesting um, for us to look for because it's on the select agent and toxin list. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, what that is, there's a, a large list. Um, many, many federal agencies have contributed to this list. And for our purposes, we're interested in the agricultural select agents. Um, I'm actually personally dealing with, um, with a survey regarding a potato a potato toxin um, that is uh, on the select agent as we speak. I'm, I'm, I'm organizing a survey up here in North Florida for that. But essentially um, what a select agent is, is it's something that's been determined by the federal government to potentially be used as a, um, as a weapon of war. Um, and so, you know, if, a, if a, an enemy of, the, of our country wanted to um, essentially cripple our food supply, they could use a select agent to to attack our agricultural resources. And so that's why we have this one on the list. Um, it's mostly distributed throughout parts of Asia um, and Africa, um, but it's known hosts are corn, sugarcane, and sorghum. Um, is an obligate parasite um, and it affects perennial grasses. Um, our perennial grasses may be reservoirs um, for the disease until the, the crops that we're interested in are in the ground. Um, this one is also of state concern, and this one, um, at least part of this complex, has been found in Florida. Um, this is actually two fungi together working synergistically. So what that means is each fungus on its own causes some damage, but when the two um, fungal pathogens come together, they cause great damage. Um, so they're synergistic with each other. And in the center of the picture, you can see this like fish eye looking dot that is the two of them working together. The black dot in the middle is one fungus, and then the um, kind of brown necrotic area around that is the other fungus working together. Um, and the phylacra matis portion of that is what has been found in West Palm Beach County of Florida. Um, the monographella matis has not been found within the United States borders. So this is something that we're looking for um, here in Florida, and I believe Illinois or Indiana also has phylacra matis, um, but again, monograph alamatus, the other half has not been found in this country yet. Um, this is where those visuals are again, um, with very little corn in Monroe County, we haven't focused on that area too much. Um, now our nursery survey, you see a couple of familiar faces here, Helicoverpa and Thematotibia, which were in our corn commodity. We also have Spadoptera latura, which is the cotton cutworm, Conagethes punctiferalis, which is our castor capsule borer or, or yellow peach moth, um, and then Stenoma catenifer, which is our avocado seed moth. And these are all trap and lure targets. Old world bollworm, as I mentioned before, um, 217 plus species of um, cultivated um, crops, including corn, cotton, citrus, okra, sorghum, soybean, um, tomatoes, and potatoes. Um, its distribution, Africa, Asia, into the Caribbean. We know it's in Puerto Rico and suspect that it's in um, the Dominican Republic, though we haven't confirmed that. Um, and we actually did intercept this one within our borders in uh, Manatee County, Florida, Bradenton, back in June and July of 2015. We caught three adult males and none since. So we treated that as a regulatory incident, but it was not an eradication. And as I mentioned before, this one is morphologically identical to uh, a native or naturalized Helicoverpa zea. And therefore, we either need to dissect the male genitalia or have them DNA and analyzed to determine the species. So you can see we've got some Helicoverpa survey here into the keys for this one, um, especially again down in um, the Key West area. Another note here, um, it is also in our tomato commodity survey. Would that one be a concern with wild cotton, which we have a lot of in the upper keys? It could be. Um, it will feed on <laughs> cotton also. Um, and I'll get to a pest here that's part of our nursery survey that's going to light up the keys on the map. <laughs> okay. Specifically because of the wild cotton presence in the keys. Um, so yeah, you, you could survey for this on, on wild cotton. You would be looking for larval, larval presence most likely, unless 
unless you've got some area that you think is of high risk, and then we could have um, Lily come place traps in that area. Um, but we would have to analyze the, the risk pathway of it um, getting there before we do that. Um, false codling moth, um, 50 plus species, including avocado, citrus, uh, again, corn, peppers, peaches, tomatoes. Um, distribution is Africa and Israel. This one is often intercepted on clementine oranges. Uh, I had a question about the um, ball uh -huh. uh, thing. I'm sorry, my brain. Um, it's, is the native one that you can't determine the difference, is that also a pest to those vegetables or not? It is considered a pest. So yeah, going back to Shannon's pest talk, um, native or naturalized. Naturalized meaning it's not technically native, but it's been here long enough that it's naturalized to the area. It is it is a pest and often commercial um, field crop growers will will spray for Helicobera pisea. So we shouldn't like worry that we're killing the wrong one if we happen to find one. No, no, no. Go ahead and, and kill away when it comes to the a genus. <laughs> okay. um, this is the distribution of false codling moth traps um, in South Florida. And you can see a lot of a lot of our South Florida stuff is in particularly the homestead area of Miami Dade because there is so much going on in that area, at least from an agricultural perspective. Um, cotton cutworm, this is another noctuid moth. Um, its host list is uh, around 120 species, some of the crops you've seen um, earlier, but also ornamentals. This one is often intercepted on uh, orchids coming into Florida, and actually we've intercepted it uh, multiple times in 2007 in Miami-Dade County and in 2014 in Orange County, specifically the Apopka area, um, associated with orchid nurseries. Um, these were um, considered interception incidences, not uh, not establishments, but we always follow up when we when we trap something like this, and uh, see what the um, you know what the um, the infestation range is. And again, here's a look at where we're surveying for this. Um, the yellow peach moth or castor capsule borer has a host range of about 65 plants from 30 different families. So it's kind of all over the board as far as what it feeds on. Um, again, distribution, Asia, Australia, Indonesia, um, and also in Hawaii. So one of our states does, does have an issue with it. Um, we are looking for this one in Florida also. Um, and this is a, a look at that area. And again, in the homestead area where we have lots of different fruit crops being grown. Is, uh, is where we're looking for that one. Avocado seed moth, this one is more specific to the uh, Lauraceae family, which includes avocados. And its distribution currently is Mexico, Central and South America. So this one is within our, uh, con uh, at least on our continent. Um, and so there is some risk of it um, moving to South Florida through um, the avocado trade industry. We do import a lot of Haas avocados from Mexico and, and other countries, though we do grow our own uh, Florida avocados here. Um, we do still import a lot of avocados. So we are looking for this one. Again, it's gonna be a similar look at the map. All right, this one, very important to the Keys, at least historically it has been. Um, and this is the cottonseed bug, Oxycarinus hyalinipennis. Um, which is a very serious pest of cotton and other malvaceous plants. Um, it's often intercepted on other important crops such as corn, grapes, and avocados. Um, it is found in Africa, Asia, Europe, and more interesting to us is the Caribbean islands. And this one was found in the Keys um, back in 2010 and it was considered established. Um, it was uh, infesting wild cotton plants on Key West and Stock Islands. And um, we went through an eradication program and it took us four years, but it was declared eradicated by the USDA in 2014. Part of that eradication program put um, restrictions on um, property owners being able to have cotton 
um, and specifically letting cotton go to bowl, um, which is what everybody wants to see when they have cotton plants. You can see it lights up the keys here because of all the wild cotton that you all have down there. This is one of our most important Monroe County uh, surveys, um, but we're also evaluating whether we need to bring back our cotton commodity survey um, next year because we now know that um, cotton seed bug has been found in California. And think about the agricultural trade between Florida and California. We have our interdiction stations looking for uh, cotton seed bug as um, produce shipments of malvaceous crops such as okra and, and other things coming through our interdiction stations. We have them on the lookout for that. But again, this one was eradicated from Key West and Stock Island back in 2014, but we're still looking for it. The Bagrata bug, I think you saw this one earlier, maybe in Shannon's talk. Um, this is um, in, the, in the stink bug family. Um, it is a pest of cruciferous crops and is especially damaging on seedlings. Um, we do have a, a population of this in the United States out West, but um, we do not want it here in Florida. So that's why we have it on our list for, um, for survey. And an interesting note on this one, it is um, part of what we call a, our free stamp program, which is a United States Department of Agricultural program um, called Federally Recognized State Managed Phytosanitary Program Pest. And basically what that means is even though this pest is in the United States, um, Florida can get federal protection against this um, because we're conducting survey for it and our surveys have to the best of our knowledge determined that it is not here and that we don't want it here. And therefore we have um, entered an agreement with the United States Department of Agriculture that they will help us protect Florida from this pest even though it's not a national pest of concern. This is a look at where we uh, survey for this in South Florida. I'm sorry, moving through this quick. I'm trying to cram a lot of information um, into this presentation. Um, and then this is the spotted lantern fly here. Um, the pest of tree of heaven, China berry and grapes. Um, it is distributed in the Northern part of our, um, of our country. Um, pathways, it's a hitchhiker on campers and other imported goods. And you can see we've got a couple of spots in Miami-Dade where we've looked for it. And these were homeowner reports of thinking they saw it. Real quick, this is our small grain survey. Um, I'm not gonna go through many of these pests. We literally just started this um, in March and we haven't really done a lot of execution on it yet. But the ones that are indicated with asterisks here are pests that we have never looked for here in Florida, at least our program hasn't. So these are new, the sun pest, the small brown plant hopper, the British root dot nematode and wheat blast. Um, and I don't know that this survey is real relevant to your area. There's not a lot of small grains grown down there, but if you know of any, my pest survey specialist Lily would be very interested to know because she's looking for sites to establish surveys for some of these pests um, down in your area. So if you have would, any small grains, please let us know. Would these guys possibly show up in bird seed? Um, sun pest maybe uh, could be potentially a dry goods pest, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, but the sun pest, interestingly, is, um, is the number one wheat pest worldwide. So yeah, it wouldn't hurt to look at your, at your, your dried seeds and things like that, but, but it's probably unlikely, but maybe your agaster would show up there. Okay, because we have sorghum coming up all over our yard from bird seed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, that might be something we can put you in touch with Lily about and she could come take a look. Okay, and then real quick, I'm just going to show you our tomato commodity list. I know I'm going over my time, I'll try to fit too much into this talk here. You've seen some of these. I'm only going to go over two of these that are the most interesting um, to your area, but this is our list of farm bill pests. Tuta absoluta is probably the number one pest of tomato worldwide. Um, so that's why I've included it in this talk here. Um, it can feed on the fruits, leaves, and stems. It is a blotch miner. So I don't know if you can see the first photo here, but the blotch mines are, um, you know, these, these, instead of linear mines, they create more of like these, ga these tunnel galleries with like finger-like projections coming off of them. They're called blotch mines. Their major host 
tomato, but they also feed on pepper and other solanaceous crops. This is a trap and lure, or you could visually survey for the damage on the leaves or the fruits. Um, if anybody's interested, I also have, these are, these are outreach materials that I have displayed here. I also have them in Haitian Creole because we know Tuta Absoluta is in Haiti. And I also have them in Spanish. Um, Tuta Absoluta has not been detected. I, but you, we, uh, again, at Homestead, we have been surveying for them pretty extensively. And then the last I've never thing I'll show you guys is potato psyllid, um, which is native to the American Southwest, has begun moving east and is introduced to Australia. Um, it does feed on the phloem, much like aphids and thrips. Um, it is named after its favorite host, but it will target tomato. And so we have a tomato commodity survey, and that's why we're looking for this. Um, the, the interesting part of this one is, is a disease that it carries called psyllid yellows or, and also zebra chip disease, which basically makes um, potato chips unmarketable because of the color, the discoloration it causes to the potato. And it has a unique capture method, which I'm going to show you here real quick on the top right. This is a 3D printed trap made with a 3D printer right here at DPI in Gainesville. They designed this and we're working to get it nationally approved for pest surveillance. Um, but uh, it's basically made with a 3D printer and it, it attracts, um, they, they tested it with the Asian citrus psyllid and we also have gotten approval to use it now with potato psyllid. So again, um, you can see down in the homestead area is where we've been surveying for this. And then last one to put on your radar is the tomato brown rugose fruit virus detected in Florida in 2019 in three community gardens, none in your area, but I thought it would be relevant to show you this um, because this is a disease of concern that's up and coming. We've done um, field surveillance of this in Florida since it was found in um, some nursery settings. And in 2020, we did not detect it once anywhere in the state. Um, but again, here in Homestead is where we've been looking for this one. And with that, I'm sorry I went over my time, Shannon and Amanda, um, but we can, I can take questions later. If, uh, if, we were, if we're out of time. Um, if anybody has questions, why do, they can put them in the chat and then um, you can answer them in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Dr. Hodges uh, is going to talk about the palm weevils. Thank you, Shannon. And we are nearing the end. You guys are just awesome. I mean, really you're dedicated, still with us uh, this late in the day. We do have some uh, goodies that we're going to share with you. And uh, so after my presentation, Shannon's going to share like a survey link with you and uh, tell you about some of the, the giveaways that we have for you for attending today. But uh, we're going to quickly talk about palm weevils at the moment. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today about palm weevils. And many of you may be familiar with uh, the palmetto weevil, which uh, we do have in Florida. But uh, first of all, what are weevils? Well, weevils, um, weevils are uh, basically beetles in the superfamily Curculinoidea, and they're known for their elongated snout. So you'll know that weevils actually have those chewing mouth parts actually at the end of the rostrum. So here you see the rostrum, you see these elbowed antennae that are typical of a number of beetles, including weevils, and, uh, and that they have the, the mouth parts, the chewing mouth parts at the end, end of the rostrum. You'll remember that when you did the build-a-bug activity, you looked at the foliage that different plants have and the damage that is seen from insects. So many of you are probably familiar with a number of weevils that damage plants. Um, and so uh, there are a number of species of weevils, over 97,000 species of known weevils, including these uh, true weevils that kind of have those, um, that long snout and the chewing mouth parts there at the end. Weevils, as a beetle, they have the elytra, these kind of candy uh, shell type cover wing or fore wing. And so it's important to keep that in mind uh, with that, that that's what a beetle is. So again, you looked at this quite a bit um, with, um, uh, you know, with, with your build-a-bug activity. 
And so here you can see the black vine weevil uh, and that chewing damage that's characteristic of weevils and other insects. I guess if you want to uh, refresh your knowledge, maybe you could post in the chat some of the other insects that you can think of that have chewing mouth parts because you focused on that in the Build-A-Bug activity. A number of weevils are actually grain pests, which are pretty serious as well. But now we're going to focus in on talking about palm weevils. And so this returns to the terminology that we began with uh, in, in the Florida First Detector session. So the palmetto weevil is actually native. And we're also going to briefly talk about two other uh, weevils that we don't have in the state of Florida, and we don't want them here, and they're invasive. And so both native and invasive species that aren't here can be passed. And in fact, all three of these weevils are passed. I would say the South American palm weevil is a larger weevil. And when we actually can return to in-person sessions and we have this particular talk in person, you get a chance to see what a pinned palm, palm weevil looks like. All three of these actually, the palmetto, the red palm weevil, and the South American palm weevil. And the South American palm weevil is a little bit larger. So the palmetto weevil, it's, it's already here. And uh, it's, uh, but it is still a pest, even though it's native. These are really a large weevils, and they're about uh, a couple inches actually in size, and coloration can vary. And so it's really important when you think about um, some of these insects. Sometimes color is something that's easy to gravitate towards at first with the identification but it's not always the most accurate identification for an insect because they can have quite a bit of variation. The host of the palmetto weevil include uh, the sable palm, and that's the native host of the palmetto weevil. And its range, its host range, really typically is restricted to wounded or dying sable palms. And so even though the palmetto weevil is here, it's not typically as much of a problem as these two invasive species would be if we were to actually have them introduced and established into Florida. There, there is some uh, damage from the palmetto weevil that has been occurring on Canary Island date palms and um, Lantanier and Bismarck palms. Um, but in general, with this association with the native host plant, sable palm, and the native palm, uh, weevil, the palmetto weevil, it's really attacking more of the distressed trees. And so when you do see the weevil damage, oftentimes it's too late. Once the weevil has been detected, it's already in the inside of the tree and, and it's chewing and it's doing its, its, its larva, its grubs are, are really large and they're, they're chewing and feeding inside the trunk. It's too late to do anything to stop the, uh, the devastation of the tree. This pop -knit condition on sable palm is pretty common. And here you can actually cut open the, uh, they've cut open the trees to show you what the damage would look like. So um, in terms of where is the palmetto weevil native to, you can see that it's native to Florida all the way over to Texas. And it's also found actually in the Bahamas. When we consider the life cycle of the palmetto weevil, the life cycle of all of these weevils will be somewhat similar, where you have the egg stage. And of course, the larval stage goes through a few instars before it actually becomes this really large, uh, uh, about an inch and a half size um, larva that's about six grams in weight. And so that's a really large larva. And so what's happening is, while that larva is in the trunk, it's, it's feeding the whole time. And so that's, that's, really, um, that's really causing a lot of damage, further damage to a wounded tree. And so these palmetto weevil, weevils are attracted to stressed trees and they're actually drawn in by what we call uh, palm esters that are released by stressed, wounded or dying trees. And so then the larva goes into this pupil cocoon. cocoon. This is like a very coconut frass, coconut, coconut looking um, uh, pupil case. And then there's the pupa there, and then finally the adult. And so with these weevils, you can actually monitor for them with bucket traps. And, um, and that's uh, just, just a way, if you do think that you, you are um, having uh, 
palmetto weevil problems. There are ways to monitor for it, but really prevention is key for the palmetto weevils because generally with healthy plants and promoting healthy plants where you're not wounding the tree during pruning is really key. Also, um, planting um, palms that are really less susceptible is important. As I mentioned with the, the native sable palm, it really only attacks more of the uh, wounded or dying, uh, or, or dying trees. Once the infestation is detected with the palmetto weevil, even though it's native and not as devastating as the two invasives we're going to briefly mention, it's really not possible to save the tree. And so the red palm weevil, why are we so concerned about this particular weevil? Well, let me tell you a little bit about its background. You'll notice with some of the invasive species that Brad Danner discussed, many of them are, are not uh, originally from here. And this, this, that's how they're invasive to begin with or potentially of invasive concern. It's native to Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands and considered to be one of the most devastating pests of palms in the world. And from a perspective of what our value is for an industry, our palm industry in the United States is worth $203 million approximately. And so this is, this is really important. And, um, and actually our Florida value of our palm industry is $127 million. So we have uh, a large portion of the palm industry is, is here in Florida. And so the red palm weevil may actually outcompete our native palmetto weevil if we were to have it established in Florida. So that would be uh, pretty devastating. We would also see palm trees in the landscapes of our major cities uh, like Tampa, Orlando and Miami and, and elsewhere and local parks at risk. And so that, that would certainly be a problem. It could also threaten the endangered species of palms in Florida, uh, such as the Miami palmetto, which is only found in Miami-Dade County. So again, much like the red palm weevil, with the name, you might assume that the red palm weevil is always red, but it's not. You can see the range of color morphs. And so again, thinking more about getting an accurate identification is really important. It can be very difficult to know the difference between the red palm weevil versus the palmetto weevil unless you're a taxonomic specialist. So what's at risk? So, so really the Canary Island date palm is a major uh, pest, is a major host of concern for the red palm weevil, but the African oil palm, the Chinese fan palm, coconut, Cuban royal palm, fishtail palm, sago palm, queen palm, Washington palms are also at risk. And actually a secondary host of the red palm weevil is sugar cane, which is a little bit odd, but uh, it, it is in fact a secondary host of the red palm weevil that we would be concerned about because it's one of our major economically valuable crops in the state of Florida. And so again, the symptoms, uh, you're not really going to be able to tell the difference in the symptomology of red palm weevil versus palmetto weevil. You'll see that late stage of the infestation with the, the drooping palm. So by the time you see this, it's just too late. And then, then you can cut open the um, cut open the trunk, and you can actually find find the larva there. And so there has been extensive sampling of the red palm weevil in in the United States. And actually, um, in in two thousand and ten, there was a reported detection of the red palm weevil in California. Uh, later, they decided that this was not exactly the red palm weevil, but a related species. But the interesting part of this story is actually that of course it was still a palm weevil that we didn't want in the United States because we don't want any palm weevils that we don't have to establish here. But what was interesting is the route that they thought that it came uh, to California in terms of how it arrived. And so you might not think about this, but how many of you, and you can comment in the chat to see if you're still paying attention here, but um, how many of you would find this larva here appealing in terms of, you know, putting a little olive oil on a, 
olive oil on it, sauteing it and cooking it as part of your, uh, your dinner tonight. Probably not many of you, but actually in many parts of the world, that is exactly what people do. They, some people will even eat the larva raw. And so there was a thought that perhaps people interested in eating the larvae were um, smuggling these uh, larvae into uh, California in order to have them as part of their diet. Entomophagy is actually uh, very common in other parts of the world. And so that is one potential route where that... Uh, detection of a related species to the red palm weevil occurred in California, which that population has now been eradicated. Technically, the palmetto weevils you could also eat. So if you do have an infestation of them and you want to try them, you know, it may be a little butter, garlic. I'm not sure. You'd have to let me know. And so here's what it looks like. And uh, you can actually Google and find videos of people eating them. It's pretty interesting. So um, when we think about how you can control the red palm weevil, there's not really a good way to control it. You could do trunk injections, and that would be quite costly, or soil applications. Mass trapping might also be a potential uh, for controlling this insect. Many of our insects we monitor with pheromones, and so that's, that's a helpful way to detect them, but it's still very labor and, and, and uh, cost uh, cost intensive. So the final one that we're going to talk about is the South American palm weevil. This is native to Mexico, Central and South America. But what's really important about this particular weevil that we don't have in Florida is that it vectors the red ring nematode, which uh, causes this, uh, this symptom, which is a red ring. When you cut up in the trunk, you can see the red ring. Its primary hosts include coconut palm, African oil palm, sago palm, Canary, Canary Island date palm, date palm, sugar cane, and other things. So it is a, a pretty, pretty devastating uh, weevil that we do not have. Here you can see that red ring symptom that I was talking about that's caused by the, the nematode that the uh, South American palm weevil vectors. And this is shown here in a coconut palm. And here you can see in Costa Rica some damage to uh, the palm trunk and the palm frond damage caused by larval tunneling. And so um, in, we have actually had more cases of this intercepted and detected, but not established. It gets back to some of the dictionary terminology that Shannon was talking about. You know, we don't want this established, but with it being so close in Mexico already, it's, it's really at high risk for, you know, continually maybe potentially being introduced. And so uh, we're constantly on the lookout for this particular uh, weevil. And again, the life cycle is very similar. Monitoring, there are pheromone traps that, that can occur, visual inspection, uh, but um, uh, the, there are pheromone traps where you can specifically monitor uh, for, for palm weevils in general, uh, but also uh, and the pheromone traps uh, are aggregation pheromones that are essentially ethyl acetate, which is, uh, so the pheromone traps and some of the, the traps that you'll see oftentimes may attract multiple types of, uh, of lures. Um, there is a lure, a pheromone lure, that is specific to the red palm weevil, but not necessarily to the South American palm weevil, uh, to my knowledge. And so the management of the red ring disease is actually important when you think about this South American weevil. Now let's look at how these, these weevils compare in terms of their, their visual appearance. And so the native, the, the biggest thing you want to look at, and it helps when we actually have the in-person session and you can see these specimens. But here you can see that the palmetto weevil has what we would call a broad pronotum or broad shoulders. And the um, red palm weevil and the South American palm weevil have these tapered shoulders that are a lot more narrow. Also looking at how these uh, lobes occur compared to uh, the elytra. See how um, this, is, um, this is actually more um, uh, taper. This is actually uh, the posterior lobe here is flat rather. And the posterior lobe is flat there. Let me go back just for a second. And, and then here, uh, the posterior lobe is, is actually um, 
On the right, the posterior lobe is more uh, lobed than flat. Finally, if you look at the, um, the, the CT on the mandible, the red palm weevil essentially has uh, CT on the rostrum if it's, if it's a male. So it has, uh, has that right there and CT are hairs. And for the South American palm weevil, uh, it has CD on the on the right on the rostrum as well, whereas the palmetto weevil does not. And there are some other features that you can consider when looking at this. But um, so we've already gone over how to report samples. Um, uh, that Michelle did an excellent job with that, and it's really important to work through your county office. And if we did think we had red palm weevil or the South American palm weevil, that would have to be confirmed by taxonomic specialists at DPI. And these slides are part of the Florida First Detector uh, series. And so the slides are online. And so those uh, guides that I uh, showed you briefly are available there as well. But with that, I think, um, uh, Shannon, we're probably uh, pressed for time. So we're probably going to go, I guess you're, you'll share a some brief information about what's in their bag, and then we're going to break into our breakout groups for a few minutes, right? Yes, so let me go ahead and share this. And uh, yeah, so just real quick, um, since you guys are uh, t tuning in and joining us for the Florida First Detector uh, workshop, we're gonna give you guys a Florida First Detector kit. Um, and I'll be mailing these to Michelle and then you can coordinate um, with her about picking them up um, so that you guys can get out to the field and sampling. And um, what you're, you're gonna get a tote bag. Inside that tote bag, you'll have a little deck um, with a handbook of Florida invasive plant pests. And then we're also gonna give you a coupon um, that you can talk to Michelle and get a copy of for a, submitting samples to the plant diagnostic center and then also the insect ID lab. And so the normally to p submit something to plant diagnostic center is like a $40 value. So if you have something that seems interesting, um, you, you ha are able to sample it and submit it and get it identified by the experts. And we also have a little field kit. So it's in a fanny pack, so it's nice and portable and you can take it with you in your garden or wherever you might be. And um, you'll have a hand lens. We'll give you some vials that you could put ethanol in. And we'll also give you a tube if you have an insect sample that you can um, ship it in and ship it to Lyle Buss, who's the insect ID uh, lab manager. Um, and the first 20 people overall who will submit a sample um, will receive a one of those handy dandy microscopes uh, that we've been talking about to attach onto your phone. Um, and then some one lucky winner will win a hat as well if you <laughs> fill out the survey. Um, and I'll be posting them in the chat. Um, I have attendance survey so that you know who um, to get, so I know how many goodie bags to make up and ship out and also who gets one. So be sure to fill out the attendance um, survey and then I also have an exit survey which um, just lets us know um, it's an opportunity to get feedback from you guys to know how we can improve these workshops and um, we just appreciate all the feedback and thank you guys for joining us today and um, I'll put those up and then we do have one more um, activity for us it's We'll have a speed round with the, the palm weevil activity. And we can all come back after the activity and I'll put the um, attendance survey in the chat again. And so with that, if you have any additional questions, you can always post them in the chat. We're gonna bring everybody back at 420, probably 427. So you'll have 10, 10 minutes in your breakout with the palm Weevil activity. Does does, uh, does anybody have any final questions they would like to ask us? You know, we're we're at our time, and uh, it's been great. But um, thank thank you, thank you all for for joining us. Thank you, Michelle, for 
for hosting uh, this with your group. Uh, we're, we're so excited. And we can certainly email the survey link. If anyone yes. wants to stay on for a few minutes, we can do that too, but... Um, yeah, if you could email the survey links would be good because otherwise when we go away, the chat goes away. <laughs> we can definitely do that. Um, I will go ahead and send that out through the um, Eventbrite email because that has everybody's email through it. So um, we should be getting that short. And I want to thank all of you um, for, you know, uh, reaching out to us and providing this training, which is really useful. It's really nice also to, to see what uh, CAPS is doing down here. And I just I thought it was a really useful uh, program. And thank you all. Thank you for hanging on uh, till 430 on a Friday. Um, I know we've got some nice cooler wet weather out there. So uh, it's going to be a nice weekend. But thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, and thank you, thank you for having um, Caps give it. There's so much more I could have covered. <laughs> we we have a lot of things that go on in the keys that are not specifically Caps related that we that I could have talked about. Also, um, there's the bean pod borer. There's pink bollworm. There, there's a, there's other pests that we are interested in down there, even if they're not directly part of our program. So yeah, I could have gone really all day with my presentation, and I apologize for. Uh, going through. Yep. Brad, do you know there's a large patch of wild cotton up at Dagny Johnson? I wonder if you guys have looked for any of these uh, cotton pests there. Um, I, I think historically we we may have, um, but that's certainly something that we can have. Um, yes, Lily is saying that she's still confirming that she's looking for it there. So um, okay. it's relatively new to our program just since um, November. Um, but it's good to see that she's already um, gotten back to some of those sites, our previous person. Yeah, she was just there last week. So, yep. Terrific. Thanks. Mm -hmm.